And uh, Alex is uh, very well known from uh, his trials to reduce data, spectroscopic data, to translate spectroscopy into clinics. And uh, he is also one of the directors and founders of the International uh, Society for Clinical Spectroscopy. Uh, so, uh, so we are really very happy that you could join our webinar and introduce uh, the validation of data uh, from infrared and Raman spectra. Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Camilla. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. And, uh, and can you see uh, my presentation on the screen? Yep. Fantastic. Well, that's a good start. <laughs> yep. So, um, well, one of the things that's been coming up in uh, in, in many of the presentations um, uh, today and, and yesterday was the, uh, the requirement to, to validate your data. And uh, this was something that I, I have been interested in um, sort of aiding the uh, the early adopters of the um, of Kevin metrics in their in their work to try to explain or demystify some of the um, some of the issues and the methodologies that are happening uh, that we would like them to be able to use more reproducibly and more um, uh, throughout all their work. So I, I, I set up this title "Too Good to Be True" and and how to validate your data. And then uh, yesterday um, we realised that actually there was probably a much better uh, uh, title for this uh, for this work, which is something like "Validate, Validate, Validate," because that seemed to be the um, the, uh, the the clarion call of of the presentations yesterday. Uh, started to, with the first first presentation from Beta, and. Um, uh, I mean, the only, the only problem with that is that it does it is a little, uh, little reminiscent of a, of a, of a movie uh, related to uh, Pearl Harbor and, uh, and, and a, an attack during the Second World War. But I think it's, uh, it, it's, um, it's a very strong message, and I think it's something that we should be carrying on throughout all of our workshops and, and conferences, uh, and, and certainly in the literature where we're um, expecting, um, which we're trying to capture the knowledge that uh, has, has gone on in an experiment and um, and to have that rolled through as uh, as um, a reassurance but also an education um, so uh, so I'm at the University of Manchester and as Camilla said uh, in her nice introduction I'm also um, a member of the clear spec society um, you can you can get me on uh, we have a, I have a website which has some information on it and uh, I'm on Twitter and as uh, as I know some of you are, because I recognise your, uh, your your faces and your uh, and your names, uh, I'm going to be talking a little about my uh, my toolbox um, for MATLAB, which is the Kai toolbox. It has its own Twitter account because why not? Everything can have a Twitter account now. Your dog, your cat, uh, your toolbox, and uh, also ClearSpec has a Twitter account. And I think it would be uh, it would be uh, uh, wrong if I didn't say something about ClearSpec. Um, uh, we have uh, this is the International for Clinical International Society for Clinical Spectroscopy, and um, it it acts as a as a, a kind of a, as, as a centering space for the the topic of, of uh, clinical spectroscopy, Raman infrared, uh, and we we touch a little on uh, um, Brillouin spectroscopy and, and some others, and uh, and we have a website and you can join it and that would be great and you can have a voice. And um, some of the uh, the people involved with that, uh, we are involved in this in this work. Um, we uh, this this workshop today. Uh, um, Margosha, uh, uh, Margosha, I apologise. I should update your your photographs. So, uh, uh, in fact, we're all a little out of date in this. Uh, and we had uh, Bade and, and Hugh uh, speaking yesterday. Uh, one of the um, uh, the the things that uh, that we're involved in is, is is an educational exercise about the whole of um, uh, fundamentals of spectroscopy through clinical uh, samples and into data analysis. And we have a summer school, which unfortunately this year had to be cancelled for uh, for some for some reason. I, can, I, I guess you can imagine why we have, we were forced to cancel that. But we will be running that again next year, and uh, and uh, that's uh, a good place to um, for your. The, the academics among you to consider sending some of your early early career um, workers. And um, something that is, is important perhaps for this specific community in this specific webinar 
is uh, is a clear spec data um, Slack workspace. So this, although uh, it's been badged as clear spec data, it's it's not formally related to the society. So uh, the, you don't need to be a member of the society to, uh, to get involved in this. Uh, it's freely available. Um, Slack is, um, is is a well recognized um, a platform for for chat and uh, uh, discussion and, and, and such like. Uh, if you want to uh, to get involved with that, uh, the uh, the website is on the screen. Um, and I'm here we have a QR code because why not? It's technology, and you're all technologists. And um, and this is a good place to to carry on any discussion that we that's been initiated in uh, in this two day meeting, um, and uh, it gives us uh, um, a more opportunity to to develop a conversation and flow. So I think I would recommend everyone um, to uh, to join that and to ask questions. Um, there, there are um, no stupid questions. We, we work in academia. It, basically, if there's something that you can't understand, um, it's, it's potentially my fault because I'm not explaining it correctly enough or thoroughly or easily or straightforwardly. And, um, and, and this acts as a platform for, uh, for, for getting involved in some of the deep work, but also as um, uh, for people who are, need an introduction to the work. Uh, there are other areas of uh, other communities that I would like to mention in this point. Um, there's another summer school, um, the, so Akin Kola and, uh, and Vasily Kovalev have a, a, um, a summer school which runs, um, uh, I'm not sure it actually ran this year, but next, next year is going to be data only. Uh, so the digital version, so you don't need to, um, to travel. And uh, we can see that actually, although it is Kind of strange, uh, giving a presentation just to uh, to a, a wall. Uh, I know that you're all there uh, out there in uh, in, in uh, cyberspace, uh, hopefully uh, listening and not just uh, checking your your uh, your Facebook. Um, uh, and so, what this is is quite a, a good way of um, of getting involved in um, in, in discussions about uh, data analysis. And this particular one is is um, is on. Um, is on bio, um, kind of bioinformatics for for clinical spectroscopy and spectroscopy in general. So that's a good topic and, and worth getting involved in. And I'd like to also mention another initiative which started earlier this year. Uh, they had a kickoff meeting in February, um, just just before um, we we, uh, we were forced to stay at home, and um, uh, and that's um, working with Python code, uh, looking at deep learning. For, um, for particularly for large data sets because it's, it's run out of Bochum and as we know the uh, the team in Bochum are producing absolutely enormous data sets uh, with no regard to the fact that other people don't have such enormous computational facilities that they have but uh, they're developing tools for that and um, they have a, a space on the ClearSpec data slack website uh, and they also have some code so it's still early days for that project but it's something that I think we should keep an eye on. Uh, the software resources. We we work in a software world, and um, and, and I, I put together some resources here. Uh, th there are obviously many more uh, out there, and um, and I've tried to capture some of those on uh, in the in the ClearSpec uh, um, uh, software uh, um, region of the of the member member zone. Um, they're in different languages. I've put together some here in, for different languages. So and uh, some have been mentioned already in in this uh, in this meeting. So. Um, um, uh, Orange will be covered uh, this afternoon by uh, Arthur. Um, Hyperspec um, uses Claudia's, <laughs> um, uh, Claudia's uh, toolbox for in, in R. Um, uh, one that, that came recently, which I haven't had the chance to explore yet, is this, I, I'm not too sure how to pronounce this, uh, Octa Octavus or something like this. Uh, uh, I noticed that this has um, a gas phase um, contribution removal so for removing water vapor and, and such like so uh, that's that's something that uh, I would be uh, I would be stealing stealing data from uh, stealing stealing their, their techniques from uh, under um, with a full, full um, uh, recognition of course uh, Libra is interesting this is for robust analysis this was mentioned by it yesterday morning um, and uh, and the Libra uh, code is also incorporated into the PLS toolbox um, I, I don't have the PLS toolbox, or at least I don't have a recent version, so I'm not sure whether it's every every uh, step is done in a robust manner or whether it's something that's turned on. But it's certainly important that they they're incorporating that. 
Um, and uh, and then there are um, or, or, yes, so Orange is Python and uh, and uh, uses the scikit learn library. So there are other there are other methods. So there are some tools out there that uh, we have. And one of the tools which um, which I am making a shameless plug about is uh, my my toolbox for MATLAB um, that was developed out of uh, just a need for supporting the uh, the research group of uh, Peter Gardner and also uh, Sir Roy Goodacre when he was at uh, Manchester. And uh, that's in MATLAB and it has a bunch of tools in there that you might find interesting. Um, uh, one of the things that the kind toolbox does is it manages many different file formats. And, and this is something that we found uh, in talking with Roy Goodacre at one of the summer schools. We realized that we were talking about all these wonderful techniques, but there was a barrier because uh, people and particularly beginners had great difficulty getting the data into these tools to build before they could do the, the Kevin metric analysis. So we we'll put some effort into uh, to doing this so we can handle um, infrared, uh, Agilent um, microscope images in both uh, single tiles and multi tiles. We read the raw data files. We don't go through a conversion step. So we can read that. Uh, this uh, toolbox handles infrared and Raman and also um, TOF sims, a secondary eye and mass spectrometry, because I come from a mass spec imaging background. So we handle some mass spec images. We can handle the Opus files directly from, um, from Bruker instruments, and that's using um, some software um, uh, that was uh, donated uh, to, to the group, which is acknowledged in, in, uh, in the help information. Um, we, uh, we can handle Metal Toledo data, but that's just the ASCII file format. And we can read the Renishaw um, Raman files directly from their version 4 file format. So it means we're not going through um, extra stages, so duplicating your, your, uh, your files. Uh, if uh, none of those are, are available to you, then uh, a few different instruments, then we can read the Grams uh, SPC file formats as well. And um, uh, Peter Gardner recently took uh, took ownership of a photothermal mirage system. And so uh, we can uh, read those files also. That's not in the, in the released part of the code, but if you uh, if you happen to have one of those instruments, well, I guess we can just make that available to you. And um, and the system will read those automatically. So it will, uh, if you just give it a file, it will work out the file format and it will read it and it will know whether it's infrared or Raman and it won't get them mixed up and all that sort of thing. Uh, if you're more interested in that toolbox, um, um, because we have a, a quite a large, uh, quite a long uh, lunch break today, uh, Kasha has kindly uh, offered me a slot at um, at 12 o'clock um, um, Central European time. I'm in a different time zone, so it's slightly earlier for me. Um, so in the middle of the lunch break. So if anyone's interested, then um, then I'll be doing a short um, a demo. Of, of the toolbox um, and so feel free to come along or or feel free to go out and enjoy the weather and uh, and have, have a longer lunch break <laughs> I won't I won't hold it against you so um, so uh, some weeks ago uh, you know we were in lockdown in the UK and um, and lockdown is a, is a wonderful time just to uh, to kick back and uh, relax and grow your hair and your beard and uh, and do nothing um, except that this lockdown has been busier than my normal working working uh, working um, week uh, because I'm supporting so many people remotely. And then I had a message from Kasia inviting me to this, and I thought, what should I do? Well, what I can do is I can take some time out to uh, to look through some more work and to chill out and uh, and to get the get our technology up to speed. And uh, and this isn't me. <laughs> but but it, it does look like these guys having some fun back in 1977, I believe that was. And I thought, OK, what should I talk about in this uh, in this presentation? Because it's, uh, it's a bit difficult to say what, you know, what's, what topic in chemometrics should we, should we cover? And um, so uh, pre-processing, that's very important. That would be a good idea to talk about. Um, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, we can talk about that in the chat. We can talk about that on the in the clear spec data uh, Slack channel. Um, something that's important. So pre-processing is important. Um, it's important because most and and um, correct me if I'm wrong. I would say all algorithms um, are only uh, expecting a single source of variance, and that's the thing we're interested in. In the clinical spectroscopy, we're interested in the clinical question. Um, if we're working on plastics, we're interested in um, something about a plastic. That's what we're interested in. We're not 
necessarily interested per se in the uh, the instrumentation and, um, and and other things under which day of the week something was analyzed on and such like and which operator was being was was operating the equipment. So what pre-processing is a way of trying to normalize that information out so that the only question left, the only piece of information that hasn't been tackled is the question that we're interested in. And that is um, and, and therefore pre-processing is very important, as is experimental design. And uh, there's a fantastic quote from uh, Ronald Fisher here, which is uh, hiring a statistician after the data has been collected is like hiring a physician when the patient is in the morgue. He may be able to tell you what went wrong, but he's unlikely to be able to fix it. And this uh, was picked up in a sense yesterday by uh, Claudia, who said, uh, I think it was Claudia, who said that we really need to have the, the, uh, the chemometrician, the, 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 someone who's going to do the data analysis involved at the beginning of the work and to, to carry through because they are as important in, the, uh, in getting you to a good and, uh, and robust answer at the end. So uh, as, just as uh, the instrument operator is. And, uh, and ideally, we would like the instrument operators to be knowledgeable in chemometrics too. But um, so get involved in the beginning is quite important. Uh, it, it, I think we could talk about things like saying, uh, look at your data, because um, a lot of people would say, I've got some data, let's, um, we get this expression, uh, let's do a PCA on it, <laughs> like, which is like, help me, I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, look at your data. It could be garbage. It, that's quite reasonable. It happens. Not everyone has perfect data on day one. Check it out. Have a look at it. It could be full of spikes. It could have really nasty noise in it. You may have forgotten to turn something on. It could have a, 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 a hair on the sample, and that's like you need to know this stuff. How many principal components should you use? I'm going to cover that. So I thought I, should, I needed to add that. Uh, we, we Yesterday we were talking about this. Don't mix your training and test data. That's asking for trouble. Uh, there's no point training a model on something uh, and then testing it with something it already knew, because you're going to get a great model, and it doesn't. It's, you're 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 not getting uh, a, a true and honest and good answer. And in some fields, maybe some people don't care so much. In clinical work, I think it's very important that we we take um, a, a very strong uh, stand about how our uh, how we manage our data analysis, because. If, uh, if things go to plan as we would like, and that we um, we push these techniques out into the uh, into the community, then we're going to be uh, some, we're going to be putting people uh, into treatments and surgeries and things, and and uh, really we need to get these things right. Don't mix your patients. That was covered a little, I guess, uh, and uh, and ideally use balanced classes if you can. Uh, there are some tricks for for that. As someone mentioned yesterday, under sampling and over sampling. And what's very important is to document what you did, because if you're going to publish what you did, the, the reason for publishing it is that other people can follow your work. And if you don't document what you did, then they can't follow your work, which means that you're putting in lots of effort and they and other people can't benefit from that. So definitely document your work. So what, what should I cover? Well, I'm going to cover PCA, of course, because everyone covers PCA. Uh, I'm doing this partly because I think it's a good introduction to this, the, the validation steps I'm going to talk about. Uh, in in my, my toolbox covers random forest and uh, adaptive boosting and k-means and some other things. And uh, there are other, other tools cover uh, many more, many more techniques. Um, but uh, lots of people come across PCA and, and I'm going to cover also canonical variance analysis in a moment. And, um, and I think it's, it, it's a useful tool to show the techniques of, of the validation. Not, I'm, I'm not here to say, look at this great data we've got. In fact, I'm not even going to show you any data. I'm only going to show you the, the results of the chemometrics. Um, this data is available from uh, Roy Goodacre on his website. Um, it's uh, it's, it's um, infrared analysis of bacteria which can cause urinary tract infections. Um, which is not relevant at all to this particular topic. The only interesting thing is that there are um, five different bacteria here and there are many spectra of each. And that's the only thing that we need to know for this. So PCA is an unsupervised technique. It has uh, no a priori knowledge. It's not used. 
We might know more about it, but it doesn't. So this is a result of, uh, of, a, of a, a, a principal components analysis um, uh, data reduction. We can see we have lots of blue dots. It doesn't really tell you very much, other than you could argue perhaps that uh, there might be some of these might be outliers, I guess. Uh, this looks like it might be related. These may be related. Maybe these are, I don't know. This all looks kind of the same. That's all, that's all PCA knew. And that's kind of a little uh, unfair because actually we knew lots more information about this, about this data. These data. We, uh, we knew which bacteria we'd analyzed on, on, with which experiment. And what you often see people doing is they label their principal components analysis plots with, um, uh, and they can label them, you can label them in different ways. The, the plots don't, the data points don't move. These are scores plots that you get exactly the same answer every time, regardless of how you label it, because PCA is not using the labels at all in its, uh, in its calculations. So, uh, so now we can see something. We've got some green dots. Uh, so actually, there was something going on here. These, all these green dots, and green is Enterococcus something or other. I can't pronounce these bacteria. Uh, I'm not very good at Latin. Uh, uh, and uh, so the, the, the Enterococcus uh, samples do appear to be sorted together, and everything else appears to be sort of mixed up. And this is only the first two principal components, and other principal components may be separating these. However, the, the, the message on this slide is we can see that there is something going on and there's a pattern in the data, but the algorithm didn't do that for us. We are doing that as a human looking at this data. And, and really, if we've got this a priori information, we should be using it. We should be using an algorithm that can take that into account because what's the point in collecting this information if we're not going to use it? So one method uh, I'm going to use here is... Uh, it's called canonical variance analysis. This is uh, this is an old method um, based on um, uh, some work done in the 1930s. Uh, I've put a couple of references there on the screen. Oh, by the way, uh, I know this uh, this is being recorded. I guess this webinar is, is being recorded, but uh, I will also be putting all of the slides and uh, the source code and samples and everything um, on a website somewhere, wherever it could be on this one, but I'll put um, in these. Um, this webinar's uh, Microsoft Teams site, but I will also put it into uh, the clear links to the ClearSpec data and links on the ClearSpec website and uh, everywhere because I'm going to go to the effort of doing it. So I may as well uh, get, get to see it again. Um, so, so uh, the, this information, um, uh, these these links will be uh, available um, later. So, can I go there? It's um, uh, I, I came across it really through Roy Goodacre. In, in his work, he calls it uh, discriminant function analysis, DFA. Uh, it's the same thing, and um, there was a, that's actually one of his very early papers that actually says that they're the same thing. Um, it's often used in, with the uh, PCA, so it's often called uh, uh, PCCVA, principal component can all compare its analysis. And the PCA is, is reducing the dimensionality of the data um, and so that the can all compare its can work because uh, there's a I'll probably say why on, on another slide. And what it does is it, 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 it so principal components analysis has orthogonal, um, uh, all, all the principal components are orthogonal by default. That's that's the rule in the algorithm, that's how it works. Uh, but the CVA is, it takes that and it warps them slightly and blends them so that they better fit the, the class structure that we, that which is our a priori information. And it helps to, um, to give us uh, a handle on getting uh, it, what, we're, what we're interested in is finding the latent structure inside the data. So canonical covariance analysis helps you get a handle on the latent information inside the data. Um, and one of the things that we need to do if we're going to do PCCPA is we need to know how many principal components should we use? And that is a very common question. And uh, there is not really a very good answer, I don't think. Um, uh, there's a reference there on the bottom. Malinowski uh, is, is quite a, a well well known um, and respected uh, chemo, a chemometrician, and he, he published a paper oh, about 11 years ago now, um, uh, and he had 14 different methods in there for uh, for calculating or determining how many principal components uh, describe your signal, your, your, and and, uh, and where to stop when you move from a signal to noise. 
Uh, and then he didn't like any of those 14, so he developed his own. <laughs> so <laughs> I think this is a this is a message that we have in uh, in Kevin Metrics, perhaps that um, that it's not a perfect um, um, world, and there's more than one way of doing things, and they are and, and some of them are different. Uh, you, you should read Malinowski's article. He, cl he classifies things into um, into, into categories like wishful thinking. And, uh, and sort of magic. <laughs> so they're really nice. And this, uh, the screen test, he does, he's not a huge fan of the screen test. And, I, and if you ever try it, you can you can see why it's a little uh, variable. Um, in my uh, in my toolbox, I use uh, a cutoff of 95% cumulative uh, explained variance. So we calculate uh, how much variance we have explained for every principal component, and we start from PC1, and we just keep adding the um, the explained variance until we get uh, above 95% explained variance. It's very simple, it's very fast, it's reasonably robust, it's objective, and um, and that's what I did in my toolbox. You can use something else. Uh, the, the press test is a good thing, predictive residual explained sum of squares or something like that. And there's an RSS test, which is kind of related. And in um, uh, Richard Brayton's book, uh, he um, uses a combination of the press test and the RSS test. I should put a reference to that book. Um, uh, and he's saying that's more robust. And so there are lots of methods. So this is my method. And uh, for this data, that um, these data that we're showing, uh, six principal components um, would, in principle, explain 95% of, um, of, of the variance in the data. So we're sticking with six principal components. What do we mean by types of variance? So um, they're, they're in, in, a, in a group structure, there are, there are, um, what we're interested in doing is two separate things. We're interested in uh, taking our groups of data and shrinking them, squeezing them uh, a bit. As I said yesterday, we want to make them smaller and we want to make them further apart. And in doing that, we will get um, better uh, understanding of what it is important in that class structure and, um, and that helps uh, give us better um, results with respect to the, the, the spectra of the latent um, variables inside. So what we're doing is we're, we're, we're reducing the, um, the vari we want to reduce the variance um, within each class. Um, we want to separate um, the class better by increasing the variance between the classes. So we can measure the total variance and the total variance of the whole data uh, set is uh, is a sum of the variance between each of the classes and the variance within each of those classes. This was first done back in 1936, I think it was, uh, by uh, by a guy called Ronald Fisher, and, uh, and um, Fisher is uh, is the guy who um, Claudia was talking about yesterday when she was talking about her. Iris data, and he was very famous for studying irises, very like irises. He has uh, he had some other particular views on uh, other you know, things at the time, but uh, but some of the work he did on on uh, chemmetrics kind of underpins the field. Um, and this was when back in 1936, where we didn't have computers. So Fisher's ratio um, is. Uh, says that uh, we have, um, the, so the total variance is the sum of the variance between the classes and the variance within the classes. And we can easily calculate the total variance um, because that's just all the data. Because we know the class structure, we can calculate the variance between each of the classes. Uh, and, um, and then we can just rearrange this. And then what we get is, um, what we're interested in is, is this, between, um, this between class information because that's what is separating our data and um, and therefore we can we can calculate this quite easily the only problem is that we have this um, this inverse uh, of the within variance and the problem with that you can't take an inverse of a matrix if it's a particular dimensionality and that's why we're doing principal components analysis first so here is the same data, but we're doing canonical variance analysis on instead. So we've done six principal components. It's the same data we had earlier, uh, and now we are uh, we, so we're only using six principal components because that explains over ninety five percent of the explained variance, and it's a slightly different shape of the data now. So um, it looks slightly cleaner. And if we compare them, then what we had before is is this this these 
spectra are spread across uh, across across a diagonal in this scrolls plot, and this these data are all in 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 one of the quadrants, which means that if we want to if we want to understand something about these uh, these green dots, we need a combination of the first principal component and the second principal component to explain that, because both of them have a contribution, because it's on a diagonal. What this what the canonical covariance has done is it's it has changed the axes, it's rotated them again. And what we've got now is the green dots are now very well expressed. The separation between the green dots and everything else is along an axis. We have some, we have a line which which can separate these, and that it's a line that is um, that is a, a not on a diagonal. Um, and therefore, well, principal you know, canonical covariance one is the thing which is separating the green dots from the other dots. And you should also be able to. I hope you can make out. Um, it's quite interesting because you can on a um, in a webinar you can use yellow on white because people are so close to the screen. Whereas in a, in a, a normal seminar you can't. It all fades out. Um, so here we have. You can see that the yellow dots are somewhat separated from the purple and the orange ones. And they're so compared to what we had before, the the data is being teased out better. So it's. A, I think it's a useful tool, and it's very easy to implement. It's in my toolbox. So you can just go use it. So this is actually a little like um, LDA. So what, what often when people are doing LDA, uh, they're not really doing LDA. They're doing this Fisher discriminant followed by LDA uh, because LDA is related to prediction. And um, and what they're doing first is they're just sort of cleaning the data ready for prediction. So it's actually the same thing kind of under the hood. So you may well have been using it without realizing it. So what we what we're interested in, in is a prediction. So uh, what we want to do is we want to predict by projection. So what we're going to do is we're going to take some unseen data, that's our training data. The model doesn't see this. We build a model and then we take our unseen data and we apply it to the model or apply the model to it and see where where the data points move. Uh, the thing which is important here is that we need we we mean centered our training data. We need to mean center our test data. But we do not mean center the test data. We subtract the mean of the training data from the test data. And the reason for doing that is we need to have the same origin because this is a matrix rotation. So if we don't have the same origin, then when we rotate things, we'll be rotating things out of space. So that's very important. So here is some data that we projected in. Um, the, uh, the, the Color dots are the same color dots, but not as many of them because we've used a, um, we've re had to reduce the data set size because of the training data. But we had to extract some test data. So training data is now a weaker model because there are small, fewer spectra in there. Uh, and we are projecting things in so we can see that our data projected in, which are the stars, or the green ones are lining broadly around the green area, which is quite good. There are some orange ones in around the orange dots. There are some purple stars in around the purple dots. So that implies that our data is reasonably good, but we don't really know how good. And that's one of the things that we want to find out. So um, something about random sampling. So if we just randomly sample data, what we will get is uh, a mixture of classes. So we're here in this, in all of these uh, little cartoons, I'm using uh, four classes, each of which has got ten spectra in, and I just colour them. And, and they, because each of them has ten classes, ten spectra, they are beautifully balanced. And of course, unbalanced data will have some bias. And I'm not here talking about um, leave one patient out type um, work. That's something that needs to be added to this, but. So, but I'm going to just talk about the different methods of doing the validation so that you understand the principles behind it. So we notice that in these uh, these five um, uh, samples that I've um, subsets that I've made, uh, none of none of these uh, spectra appear in any of the others. They're all uh, independent. So this blue one here is it only appears in this set. It is not any of these other blue ones. And you'll notice that the, the distribution of each of them is different, which is not good. And actually, one of them is completely missing the yellow ones. So if we build a model um, with these four and we test it with this one, then we're not testing the yellow dots. Also, the yellow is, is, is 
high for example this one so this training data is strong in yellow uh, so the, that will bias the model that will bias the model somewhat towards yellow because the, the model gets to experience more of that so this is the holdout test this is a simple one this is quick and dirty this is what you you know, most people will encounter first. So we have our training set, and we've just put all of our data in our training set. And we want to calculate our test set. So what we do is we randomly select some data from our um, from our um, our data. So sorry, this was our this is originally our, our data. Now it's our training set. Uh, so we I've I separate things into eighty and eighty by twenty. So this is now 80% of the original data that we train on, and we're going to test it with 20% of the original data. Nothing in the test data is in the training data. They are all separate. To do this, we only get we only want one test, and um, so that's nice and quick. We get a single answer. So what we do is what we've done here is we've randomly split the data into training and test set. We use the training set. To develop our model, we have to use the same pre-processing steps. We uh, on, so the idea is what you do is you, it's easiest to do all the pre-processing first and then separate the data. So long as you're not doing any um, scaling, because what we, or we what we don't want to do is affect any of the columns if we do that, because otherwise we are influencing our test data. But if you, for example, vector normalizing or, or um, Denoising, well, I'll get in discussion with that later. I think it's kind of interesting because you often want to denoise everything as a group, but then you're you're influencing your test data by by denoising it with respect to your um, your other data, and, and, and perhaps some of you will have some some input on that. We're subtracting the mean of the training set from the test set, and we apply to the model. And we rotate the data, and then what we want to do is we want to measure how far each of our stars landed compared to where we think it ought to have landed. And I'm going to count how, uh, how many things we got right. So this, this distance is something that we need to measure. What is our, how do we measure our distance? So there's two different ways uh, of measuring distance that I want to talk about. There are, there are a, a number of others. Um, we've got Euclidean distance. So Euclid on the right, um, uh, this is the, the most recent color photograph I have of, of Euclid. Um, uh, he's uh, he was around quite a long time ago, um, and uh, Euclidean distance is the most common. E Euclidean distance is a, a straight line of sight, in a sense. So in these colored dots, these colored dots here are how far something is from the center. So all these four dots are the same distance from the origin. And we can see that some of them, the green ones, lie outside of this, uh, of this distribution, and the purple ones lie inside the distribution. And um, uh, Prasantam uh, Mahalanobis here in uh, roughly 1940, some some time later, shall we say, um, uh, developed a method of of, um, of determining a distance metric, which takes into account the distribution of the data. So, uh, in uh, using a Mahalanobis distance, we get a lower value for these two, which are represented in, uh, in magenta here, because they're inside the data. So it's actually you would imagine that they should be closer to that overall data. Uh, data collection than these green ones. So we use the Mahalanobis distance uh, because it's a more robust measure of distance. So um, here is a holdout test. This is uh, so we we split our data 80 20. We've um, uh, we've done a principal component uh, canonical covariance analysis on the training data. We projected our data in and. Um, and, and, and this took, uh, it's very fast, uh, there are only 236 spectra, it's almost instantaneous, or it took longer to actually generate the plot. Um, and in this case, we, we um, according to our metric, we are getting 77% uh, correctly classified. Um, we'll cover that uh, a little more in a moment. If we do it again, we get a different answer. So that's not great, is it? Uh, um, and, uh, and this time we get 81%. Uh, Correct classified. So if you only did it once, you get, if in this case, I would either have got 77% or 81%, which one's right? We don't know. And that's a problem because the holdout test is not reliable. If you're only doing something once, you only get one answer. And, um, and we don't know how uh, robust that answer is. We don't know how typical that answer is. 
and that's something that we should be exploring. So what we have, uh, a way of, of, of measuring something is a little, uh, that, uh, a side angle here before we go into other methods of, um, of validation, is um, a contingency table. So this is a way of representing our results, and it's a way of um, determining some metrics from our, um, our, our prediction and our distance measurements. So a contingency table is based on the idea of a two-class test. Uh, things are either true or false. There's nothing in between. There's no gray area. There's not a gradation. This is only uh, so there are only two classes. It's not a multiple class. So what we've been showing so far, there were five classes, five, five classes, uh, and, but now we're only looking at two classes, and, and because that's how this um, at this point. And um, to do this, what we um, we, we can use this to assess our model, uh, and, and we can describe, we can calculate some objective metrics for this, and that's quite important. And to do this, we, are, we have a perspective. So, um, so in this case, I'm going to say I want to predict class A. You might say I want to uh, determine whether a person has cancer, and that is the question you're trying to solve, because you have to have a question so that you can frame your results. Now, I put a cautionary note up here. Um, different authors and different commentators will express the table uh, in one in a transpose. I put the the true a priori knowledge in columns, some uh, and I and then the predicted information in um, across. Let me show you show you one of these. So, the, the my true information is in columns, and the predicted information is across, and and uh, other people will put them the other way around. And I noticed that yesterday, some speakers had true in columns predicted in rows, and others had true in rows and predicted in columns. So it's important when you um, to document your your, uh, your contingency tables uh, and your confusion matrices uh, matrices later um, to, to to show which way around they are. And when you're looking at them, make sure to check that information so that you're reading the table correctly. Because otherwise, they all just look like grids of information. But it's important to realize that sometimes they're transposed. So what have we got here? So anything that we would put in this box, we would say it. we knew it was class A. It was predicted to be class A. Therefore, it's true, and it's a positive result. Anything in this box, let's say, we knew that it was class A. We predicted it to be B. So we got that wrong. So that's, um, so that's a, in this case, a false negative. Over here, we knew it was not A. We knew it was B, therefore it was not A. We predicted it to be A, so that's wrong also. And here, we knew it was, it was class B, so it's not class A. We predicted it to be not class A, so that's correct. So this diagonal are things we got right. This diagonal are things we got wrong. And that's um, and that's important. And this is why it's important if we have a transpose, because if we have a transpose, then this the false positives will appear down here, and the false negatives will appear up here. Reading down this column, so this is all of the all of class A's samples. So we can sum this co this column to here. So that's a total number of spectra in class A total number of spectra in class B. And then here we have the total number that were predicted to be in class A and the total number that were predicted to be in class B. Some of them were right, some of them were wrong. Um, so this, the, these uh, expressions we will be using in a moment to, um, uh, to, to calculate some further metrics. So this is, these, these are wrong and these are wrong but they're not the same wrong because we have two different types of error. We've got type one error, which is a false positive, where we have something that's wrong and you're saying is right. So that is the type one error. So this, uh, this gentleman is probably probably not pregnant. I would, uh, I would hope, I thought he's, uh, you can see he has some, some shock on his face. <laughs> so, uh, so he's, he's clearly concerned. Uh, maybe the, uh, the the physician here needs to double check his spectacles. Uh, and uh, this is different from saying uh, that 
we know that something is right, but we're, we're, we're saying it's wrong. So here this physician is making a mistake because this lady certainly looks like she's pregnant or, or, or she has some serious issues if she's not. Uh, and um, so this, these are two different types of error. One where we're, um, we're saying something and it's not right. And another one is we're not saying something that is right. And, and does that matter? Well, uh, well, yes, it does, particularly in our line of work, because we are uh, we want, want to be involved in clinical analysis, and therefore we're going to make some judgments about um, medical treatments that people may, may need to uh, need to take, and that means that we have a certain responsibility to make sure things are right. So, what we want to do is minimise our false negatives. Uh, so we want to minimise our, our um, uh, the, the one on the bottom bottom left. Um, I want to minimize this box uh, because uh, if if we were in the top right box, if it was a if it was um, um, a true uh, negative, let's oh, get this wrong. If it was a false positive, I should write them on this thing. If it's a false positive, then we say we we think that you are ill. We think that you've got an illness. Maybe you, you, you know, there's something wrong with you. And at that point, you would go into a system and you would have more tests. And then, if it turned out you were wrong, then hopefully, hopefully, someone will catch that um, that information, and and therefore the patient will be kind of rescued from your mistake. If, on the other hand, we give a false negative, and we give someone the all clear when we say, uh, "Oh, you've come in." Um, you're, you're not feeling well, actually, no, there's nothing wrong with you, go home, you'll be fine. Then they will not receive the treatment that they require, and that could be uh, very damaging to them, or they might receive the, the, the treatment later, and, we're, and we have a responsibility to get them right. So how do we uh, how do we measure things? So on our tables, we have these uh, true positives, true uh, negatives, false negatives, uh, true negatives, and from these we can calculate certain metrics. So if we take our uh, true positives and we um, and divide that by uh, the the true positives and the false negatives, what we get is um, something that tells we get sensitivity. It's called sensitivity, and something that tells us how good is our model at getting things right. And that's nice to know. We want to know how uh, we want something that's good at getting things right because that kind of makes sense. Yeah. Another metric we can calculate is if we take the true negatives and divide that by the false negatives um, are added to the true negatives, this gives us something called specificity. And this is telling us how good we are at making sure we don't get things wrong. So, and this one is an area which we are um, probably something that we ought to be uh, stressing a little more. We don't want to say how good our model is. We always like to say, hey, I've got a great model. We want to say, uh, how, how good is it, um, how, how robust is it, how safe is it to use? So specificity, I think, is something that we, we should be um, uh, keeping an eye on quite carefully. So here's an example, contingency table. Uh, this is, so this is a two by two, so this square here in the middle here is where we calculate things, is where we put our, our results. Uh, the bottom row and the column at the end here, these are calculated from these, so Going across, we have 16 um, samples predicted to be A. We have nine samples predicted to be B. Of course, accident, we actually had 14 A, not 16. And we had uh, 11 B, not nine. So there's some error in here. And so we can calculate the sensitivity of recognizing group A is 86%. And we can calculate our specificity of recognized group A, which might be, say, that you have cancer, for example, uh, being 64%. So this is an objective metric that we can use in uh, going from our spectra through our uh, data analysis to something that we can report. So this is great because we have um, two uh, classes. So uh, and this is a, a in this case we're expressing this as a hard classifier. It's either right or it's wrong. If it's wrong, it must be the other one because there's only two things. It, something must fall at one or the other. So um, uh, we had this example yesterday of cats and dogs and rabbits. This is separating things between uh, is is something a cat when well, no, they'll say cat because if it's not a cat, it's a dog. So if it's a rabbit, well, it gets the rabbit gets put in with dogs. 
which might not be very good for the rabbit. But uh, aside from the uh, the bad analogy, and um, please don't telephone the uh, the animal res rescue people. Um, then um, this, so this is a problem that is based around two classes. But we often have more than that. So we can extend our contingency table to form a confusion matrix. And here we have more than two classes. So again, this is relating to our test data. It's not our training data. Our training data builds the model. We use our test data, our unseen data, to test that model. Um, and the, the training data that none of the test data ever appears in the training data because otherwise we're going to get the wrong answer. Because we've got more than two, we can't calculate sensitivity and specificity anymore because the way we were calculating that earlier was we were saying whether if something was true, was not true, then it must be in the other class. But now if something is not true, we don't know which other class it could be in. So that causes more problem. So what we're going to use here is we're going to say, uh, what the percentage was of getting things right. So here's an example of this. So here we've got five classes. They may be bacteria. In fact, uh, these were the data from bacteria, but not from the infrared data. This is from an uh, imaging mass spec uh, experiment. So again, we, we read it in the same way. The diagonal is things that are correct, uh, correctly predicted. So we know that uh, so we had four class A, three of them were predicted to be A, so that's right. One of them was predicted to be B, so that's not right. So of this, we're getting 75% of those are correct. This one, 11, we had, we had 12 samples of, of sample B. The model said 11 of them were B, so that's good. One of them predicted to be wrong, so that's stronger, 90%. This one was the best. We had 12 samples. The model got them all right, so that's excellent, 100%. This one is particularly oh, sorry. This one's particularly poor. This one, um, the model only got two of them right. It obviously thinks that they look a lot like this one, this uh, bacterium B. Uh, so we're only 25%. So this confusion matrix uh, gives us a different type of information. We can look at the overall. Overall, how many things did we get right? But actually, we could say that this model, if we were going to use it, would be very good for finding um, uh, this class C information, which are the green dots actually on the earlier one. We can see that they were well separated. It's very good for that, but it's really terrible for this. So the model could be good for some things and bad for others. And that's kind of an interesting um, uh, extension to the way that we would normally look at our data. So we did uh, we did one test. We um, we um, uh, we did our holder test. We separate our data into eighty percent of the data we put into the training set, twenty percent of the data we put into our test set. We did one test. We get one answer. Uh, how confident are we on that answer? We know that we did uh, two of these tests earlier, and we got a different answers. So that's not necessarily great. So uh, how do we know which one's right? We did two tests, we got two different answers. Well, how do we know either of them are right? How do we know how close to being right they were? Um, we could repeat this experiment. We did it twice, we could do it three times, four times, five times, randomly selecting things again and again and again. And we get lots of different answers. And eventually we will get some sort of distribution. But there's a smarter way of doing this. One smarter way of doing this is leave one out cross-validation. So this was mentioned yesterday, uh, Lucy V. Um, I don't know who Lucy V is, but um, leave one out cross-validation. So here we start with all of our data. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take one sample out, and that makes our test set. We train our model on this. We test it on this little fella on, 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 on their own. We get one answer, and we write that down in our, in our chart. And then what we do is we do it again. So we start from our data again, and we take the next one. So we, all of our data, less the one which has gone into the test set, becomes the second training set. We test it again, so that's now two tests. Guess what we do now? We take the third one, third spectrum, 
that becomes the test set. Everything that was not in the test set is the training set. We do that again. Now we've got three separate answers. Each one was built on a very large um, pool in the training set. It was only tested with one example. Uh, and, and now we've got up to three. And then we go and we keep going and we do many tests and many, many more tests and lots and lots and lots of tests and we're getting exhausted by our tests. And any minute now where the computer is going to burn up and we're going to die in a, in a, in a ball of flame. And what we now got is the same number of tests as we had original data. So we started in this case, we started with 40 spectra and now we have 40 tests. So we've got 40 different answers. So from the 40 different answers, we can create uh, a distribution. So this is our, our, our Lucy V test on the same data. We can see it looks broadly similar. In fact, all of these look broadly similar because the way that the data was, um, it was quite easy to separate the green ones from everything else. Um, all of the dots are our training data. Here's one little star over here because in this particular example, there was only one training set. So this is one, there were 236 tests. This is the example of one of those tests, one of those predictions. This is where the, uh, the, the blue sample was predicted. It's conveniently relatively close to the blue data. Uh, it was right, therefore, for this single test, it was 100% right. Uh, other tests uh, were not quite so good, and uh, we got 79% um, of those were right. Uh, I I'll calculate the standard deviation coming in here. I've got a feeling this might not be right. So I'll let it discuss that with someone later. Um, and if I can fix that, it does seem to be really rather high. Um, so we can check that later. However, Lucy V, we get the same number of tests as there were original samples. For 236, that's not too bad. If you've got, uh, I think Thomas was talking about, um, about a million spectra. Uh, and we, you know, then, then all of a sudden we, we really want to do a million tests. This is a problem. Uh, every test that we do, we're using all a million minus one spectra. So all the models will be very strongly related. They're all, all going to be very strong models. We're only testing on one example each time. So we don't have a lot of test in that state in that sense. Uh, it, it can be slow. Uh, depending on how large your data set is. Each test is not necessarily slow, but there are many tests. So this you can parallelize this. So if you have a multi-core machine, you can do that. For this data took, uh, I, I think I can remember, this is something like two minutes or something, or a minute on my 11-year-old computer, which is already doing other calculations at the same time. Uh, this Lucy V has no randomization in it. We Every sample gets seen it doesn't matter what order you do them in, you get the same answer. Uh, obviously, your tests will be different, but the overall result of the tests are the same. Uh, when I say they're different, I mean that they will appear in a different order, but all of the tests will, all of the results will appear. Uh, so there's no random, so it's reproducible, which is uh, which is useful, um, certainly if you need to um, show your data somewhere else. So. Lucy V didn't matter. There was no randomness in it. It didn't matter if you started with a randomly organized um, a data set because each sample was taken out separately. So there was no random, uh, there was no sampling going on. It was all, all everything, sorry, everything was randomly sampled. It didn't matter whether they were in groups or not. But if we want to do things in another way, we want to put things into groups. We want to make it a smaller data set checks. So here we have, um, uh, this is random. Um, sampling. So what we do is we want to break our data into um, five classes. Mm, animation didn't work. Is it going to work or not? There we go. So here uh, what we're doing is we're dealing, it's a bit like dealing cards. Imagine you have a, a, a deck of playing cards. Uh, you separate um, your suits, your spades, hearts, diamonds, clubs. You've got your uh, your um, companions around the table that you're playing playing cards with, and you deal them out. So you would deal out all of the spades first, then all of the hearts, and then all of the diamonds, and then all of the clubs. And that means that each person will have uh, broadly the same number of each suit. So that is what's called stratified sampling. Um, what it does is it produces um, groups, subsets of the data that have 
um, as near as possible the same composition. Now that doesn't mean to say they're balanced, these classes are balanced, but they will all have the same composition. And that's important because it means that every test that we do on each of those samples will be equivalent to the other tests and we're not swinging some tests or are, are biased more towards the fact that we had lots and lots of blue spectra uh, in, in that. So there's the test, the, the model becomes very good at identifying blue spectra. Um, one thing to watch out for here is this is, uh, this is termed as stratification, so stratifying samples. And if we're working in a clinical environment, um, th stratification is the way that, um, that clinicians and physicians decide which medicines you should have. So you, you put patients into different categories. So they normally start you certainly in, in the UK. I suspect that they give you a medicine which is kind of appropriate for your illness, but they give you the cheap one first or the one that covers most cases first, and then they go to more and more specialized, more possibly more expensive samples. And depending on what your illness is, then you'll get treated with a particular thing. So that's, that's stratification in medicine. This is stratification in statistics, which is not the same thing. So be careful when talking to clinicians, make sure that that uh, they are understanding what you're saying. So now this is, we're going to cover a different kind of cross-validation. So we just had leave one out cross-validation. This is a K-fold cross-validation. And uh, so here what we've done is we've stratified our classes. And um, each of these sets was produced from the uh, from the previous thing, from the previous uh, slide here. So we've, we've, um, we've uh, stratified data, we've kind of dealt, uh, dealt our cards into five different uh, um, uh, playing partners uh, on the card table. And what we do is we say we take one of those out and we call that the test set. We pool all of the rest of the information, uh, which becomes the, the training data. So we train on, on all of those. We test it on this and we get an answer. And then we put that back and we take out the next one. And then we pool all of those four, which are not test set. We train a model on those four and we test it with one. And that gives us our second um, answer. And then we do that again and we get our third answer. And then we do it again and we get our four and we get our fifth. This is five-fold cross-validation. Uh, we could have um, the other common sizes. So uh, people often use tenfold. Uh, which case we would have 10 groups, each of which ideally would have the same composition. Um, and then we would do 10 tests. So um, the number of, uh, of outcomes is K, and in this case K is five, and we're breaking things down into five sets. The number that you break them down into it depends on um, how many uh, samples you have to begin with and uh, what your competition resources are. So um, I, I'm using a five-fold cross-validation here as an example. Other people use 10, some people use three. The number, I imagine that there are reasons for picking different sizes and biasing towards large numbers and small numbers. Uh, I'll let uh, some of that will probably come up in the chat and I'll let someone else answer that because uh, um, uh, I would have to think about it too hard. So here's our example for K-fold. And notice that the, uh, the, the, the plot has flipped uh, in the, uh, uh, along the y-axis. The green dots are on the, on the left now rather than the right. Uh, that makes no difference because, of course, all we're doing here is we're just um, negating the, uh, or in inverting the loadings. So it, it just depends on uh, the starting point for the data. So the means the same. It's just that we would interpret our loadings in the opposite sense. So the score on canonical variant one earlier, the green were in positive. Um, canonical covariate one, and therefore the the, the commonality in the, in the data were pointing uh, in positive um, space, and now the same ones were pointing negative negatively. So you just um, it's as if you were standing on your head, or in Australia. There probably possibly are some Australians on the call. Uh, so now this this didn't take very long. It took three and a half seconds because we only did five tests. Uh, previously, we did 236 tests, so it took a little longer. Now we do five. Um, so that's good. We're getting uh, a slightly different answer. Um, this particular one, so this is one example of the five, about 81% there. Overall, if we take all five tests and took the mean of the percentage correctly classified, we get 75. We've got a 
small standard deviation, which sounds kind of seems a bit more reasonable than the other one. I'm a bit concerned about that. Uh, each test is the same, broadly the same test, takes about the same. It's just there are fewer of them, so that's better. And that's with fivefold. So if we say something about fivefold, uh, about kfold, um, we're doing a small number of tests, so that's quick. In leave one cross validation, we've got 236 um, spectra. We oh, in, in in our in our data set. So we were each model was 235 spectra in the training set to develop the model. Now we don't have as many as that because we've taken more to put them in the test set. So each model is a little weaker, but it's not not a lot weaker. We have more training on scene data to test each of those models with, which helps to reinforce the weakness in the model where you can test it more thoroughly. Um, it's quite fast. We don't have so many tests. Uh, so uh, that's a very good. If you have large data sets, then KFOLD works very well. Generating the folds it has some randomization in it now. So we need to document that randomization and, uh, and we need to in inform people what, which spectra were in which set, which fold. So which spectra were involved in which fold, because fold one sometimes is part of a, the training set and sometimes it's part of a single test set. So we need to know which spectra are in which fold for reproducibility purposes. So we need to record that information. And one comment I, I should say about, um, about randomization. Uh, and this came up on Twitter, where uh, a guy I follow um, uh, is, is uh, can't remember his name. Oh, you killed me for this. Uh, his, his Twitter account is walking randomly, and, um, and and in there he commented that if you do uh, if you're parallelizing your algorithms across multiple machines on a cluster, then each 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 cluster device is is exactly the same which means that if you're doing randomization, each one will start with exactly the same random seed, which means that if you, they will all give you the same answer. So what you need to do is you need to randomize on one machine so that the, the random number generator can produce truly random numbers and then deliver each of your cluster devices with a different um, member of that random grouping. Then otherwise, otherwise they, they will give you this the same answer. So um, because computers are not very good at random, um, which is good generally, we want them to be uh, robust. But uh, when we actually want them to do something random, we have to be careful about how we get them to do that. So uh, sampling. So now we're going to talk about so, um, another method uh, of of validating your data, and to do that, we need to talk about sampling. So really we're, 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 we're doing something that is slightly um you know we're, we're not working in a perfect world in a perfect world we would analyze everything we would analyze all the cells in your body and we would know everything about everything if we were going to measure the heights of all the all the school kids we want to make an estimate of how tall school kids are uh, at uh, age uh, 10 let's say um and in the country and if we were to uh, to do that we would have to go around the country and measure all of the school kids who are 10 years old and then we would have the answer. Of course, by the time you got around, they're not all 10 any longer, but you would have to, you'd have to line them up at the correct time. It might take too long. That, would, that is the population. We don't have the population. We might go to a local school and measure the heights of the children. And then we would, that would be a sample of the population. And the problem with sampling is it could be biased. If you live in an area where there are tall children and you went to that school, you would get an answer which implied all the school kids have a are tall. Somewhere else they might all be short and um, you were not getting a true answer. So we're always sampling um, and, uh, and the more samples you can take, the more confident you can feel about how good your results are. But, um, but we must always bear in mind that we are, we are, only, we are taking a small number of the, the whole uh, information that we have. So there are two different types of sampling, uh, sampling without replacement and sampling with replacement. Uh, I normally would say something with and something without, so, but without replacement is the one that you will have come across, so we're going to talk about that first. So something without replacement is, um, is uh, what you would do if you, um, if you were drawing a lottery or, or something where, um, or, or uh, in this case we've got Rudd Hullett um, uh, pulling a drawing out of Poland, I don't know 
I didn't get to find out who, who Poland are playing, but um, I'm sure someone can put that in the chat and we would watch that. Uh, so Rud uh, took, you got the bag or whatever it is, they have a glass bowl with some um, with the with pieces of information in, he takes one out against Poland. Excellent. That goes on a on the side, gets written on this big screen behind him. That's fine. You then go and get the next one out to find out who Poland are playing. England, perhaps. Who knows? Um, it's good luck, England. Ooh. Yep, that's fine. But <laughs> each one will be taken out independently. That goes until the bowl is empty, until the bag is empty. Everything has been taken out and has been documented in the order that they were removed. So that is sampling without replacement. Now then, sampling with replacement is different. Sampling with replacement, we take um, the ball out from the bowl, we read what the name of the team was, we put that back in the thing, put it back in the bowl, mix it up, take another one out, read which one it was. It could be the same answer. We could get and take out Poland every single time. And we can keep going because the, the, the bowl with the, with the cards in never gets empty because we always keep putting things back in. So we can continuously remove things from, from that bowl, record the information and put it back in again. So this is sampling with replacement. We are sampling it and then replacing it back. And this is used in uh, bootstrap sampling. So we need to talk about sampling now. So, sampling was developed in the 1970s by a guy called uh, Bradley Efron, and, uh, and, and quickly that was picked up by um, uh, Robert uh, Tipshinari, and, and they worked together on that for a while and developed it, and, um, and it, it has become a very um, well-recognized method of doing robust sampling, and they won awards, and this is, um, uh, this is Bradley Efron uh, getting his, uh, his award from the... Um, from the American government, uh, the National Medal of Science, for doing this. He works at Stanford, still, still there. And bootstrapping uh, methodology of sampling is what is uh, uh, inside uh, random forest selection. And that's one of the things that makes random forest quite stable at its, um, at it, at its modeling capability. So usually what we do is we would say if we have, uh, say we've got, um, in, in my case, 236 spectra, we would create two, 236 random um, distributions of, from this data. So we have the same number of samples. So every bootstrap will have 236 spectra in. Now this is random, which means that sometimes we'll get the same thing out. Ruth Hullett earlier pulled out Poland many times. Sometimes we will get something that has not been removed. Other times we'll get something that has been removed. So if I want to remove something 236 times, sometimes I'm going to get duplicates. So I've removed things 236 times. I get a list of my spectra. There will be some duplicates in there. That means that there are some things that were never in there that were not in my list. And those will become the test data. So that is one bootstrap. That goes off to one side. That's our training data and our test data. Then we begin again. So duplication is important. Um, why I call it bootstrap? Uh, there's an interesting quote from, uh, from Efron, uh, who's uh, obviously looking a bit happier now. Uh, he says, I'd also like to thank my many friends who suggest names more colorful than bootstrap. He doesn't say why it was bootstrap. Uh, more colorful than bootstrap, including Swiss Army Knife, Meat X, Swan Dive, Jack Rabbit, and my personal favorite, the Shotgun, which to paraphrase Tuki, who's, uh, who's a colleague of his, uh, well-known statistician, uh, can blow the head off any problem if the statistician is, uh, can stand the resulting mess. <laughs> so it, it is complicated to keep track of what's going on in the bootstrap sampling, but, um, but Tuki was, was well, very much taken by it. So um, this is how you calculate uh, your training data from your, uh, from your data. So we are randomly sampling things from your data. And sometimes we will be getting duplicates, as we can see. And sometimes um, the things are only chosen once. So we started, in this case, we have 40 spectra. We have, we're sampling 40 times. Our training set, which we've got up now, is 40 spectra. Some of them are unique. Some of them are duplicates. Statistically, we can calculate that 60% of the training data will be unique. And then what we do is we take all the things that were not in the training set 
and those go in the test set. And we do that because we cannot test a model with things that are in the training data. So these are, are different. Now the problem is because we don't know how uh, how much duplication we will get because it's random, then our test data will be different sizes depending on um, on what that duplication was in any single boot. This is a single bootstrap. This produces one training data, one test data. We run it again. Well, if you run it again here, of course, you're going to get the same answer because it took me hours to create this animation and I wasn't going to do another one. So uh, it could be, it is possible in the same way that the lottery numbers could come out one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, and that is equally likely as any other lottery result. Um, in the UK, our lottery, that still comes up with 14 million to one. So if you think your odds are good at winning that, then you'll find they're not. <laughs> and the probability of you getting 14 million on the UK lottery in, in pounds, given that it's about a two pound stake, is, is not 14 million. <laughs> you get much lower than that. It goes to charity, so that's not so bad. So what it could be, for example, in the same way that Rudd drew Poland many times, that we could get this green one all 40 times, which would mean that our that particular training data set would be pretty poor because it's going to be so full, but our test data would have everything else in it. It would have 235 samples in it. The probability of that is very low, so we don't worry about it. So that's a single bootstrap. So this is the results of a bootstrap uh, example. Uh, this was 100 tests. This is one of the tests out of those 100. Um, the 100 tests only took 55 seconds, which wasn't too bad. We've got, um, again, we're expecting these things in about the 70s. This particular example had uh, was 86% was 80, correctly classified, but on average, it came out at about 77. And we've got a deviation of, um, uh, of about 5% then. So if we, we can just keep going, we can repeat and repeat and repeat. And the argument is that you should repeat many times and you should repeat 50 times or more. And, uh, and there are some people that say you should repeat hundreds of times, possibly a thousand times, depending on how big your data is and what the distribution of your data is and what you're trying to capture. In this example, uh, when I went to a thousand, each test is still only taking like two um, 20 milliseconds or something, so it's not taking very long. So the thousand tests didn't take very long. But if you had a large number of samples and uh, for a test, and depending on the test, this can all convert. It's not a particularly long test, but um, but a random forest could take you know a few minutes. Then if you want to do a thousand times, it takes a long time. Um, our mean is is settling on a on a, on a, a slightly different number. And our, uh, our variance is reducing a little. And this is, these are the, this is what, what's considered to be the strength of the, the bootstrap approach that we get. The, the, more you, the, more some, the more times you run, the more bootstraps you, you create, the more tests you do, um, the, the more uh, confident you can be about the, the mean value, assuming mean was the metric we were wanting here, and, uh, and, uh, and the variance um, is, is relatively small. Right? So that, that can be quite good. So uh, summary of the bootstrap, uh, we have a lot of samples, uh, a lot of tests, um, and, uh, and, and possibly uh, hundreds of tests, and this can be, um, uh, that's something that you, you have to take in, into account, you can't just do one. If you just do one, then it's probably worse than the holdout test um, because, because you've got duplication in there. Um, model, the model is a training set, it will have some duplicates in it. Um, it's, the model, is built from, in our case, 236 spectra. So it's built from a lot. K-fold was built by a smaller number than that. So the model is, is relatively strong, with, even though it has duplication in it. Um, the test the test set size will vary, which, which causes some problems in um, calculating metrics, particularly in MATLAB, because we, are, we like to work with uh, matrices. And the matrix, you know, if you create a test set matrix, it's ragged. So um, that, that's, uh, it's a, that's just a coding issue. We're, you know, it's, um, we've managed that. It can be slow, but it, you, it's not iterative. Therefore, you can easily parallelize this uh, on multi-core machines, bearing in mind the, the multi-core, the, um, the randomization seed issue I mentioned earlier. And, um, and then it's highly random internally. So you really need to document um, what your training and test set composition is for each um, 
of your uh, of your bootstraps, so, so that you can um, you can document that and then and for reproduce it. So, uh, just a, a comparison there then of the of the four methods that we've used here. So, a uh, holdout test. We want to do one test. We're, we're splitting the data. I, I personally use eighty twenty, but other people. I think there's uh, one. Um, uh, speaker yesterday said, uh, I think it said 50-50. Uh, sometimes it's 75-25. Uh, it, it just uh, different people will. There's no no hard and fast rule. It just depends on on, on personal view. You only do one test. Um, the, uh, the the Lucy V. We have um, a lot of samples in the training set. We have a very small number of samples in the test set, but we do lots of tests. K fold. We have. Uh, it's easier to start here. We start with uh, our, our data is split into K folds. So each test training, each test set has um, uh, a particular size and everything else is goes into the training set. So our K is is often five or ten. Um, the something actually uh, just a little throwaway uh, piece of information here. Um, we, we were talking earlier uh, yesterday about. Um, um, what do you leave out? Leave one patient out, and, and such like, and um, duplicates uh, in, in certain circumstances, and um, and the support vector machines came up, and a lot of people will use the libsvm um, a library for calculating uh, the support vector machine models in in MATLAB, uh, and, and possibly elsewhere, and that uses a threefold cross validation internally to to develop its um, which which of the the internal models it decides are the strongest, and then it brings that back and says, "This is the this is the best model I found," which you then test with your your independent test set. Um, but because it's doing a, th a threefold cross validation internally, uh, that's not stratified. So if you happen to have in your data uh, samples from different patients, for example, you may have stratified that. You might know what it is, but internally inside the algorithm, it will it will jumble those up. So often, what you'll get is a very strong model based on its own internal results. And then, when you test it with independent data, you get a very poor result. And that's possibly one reason why, because it's jumbling up the test and training sets inside the model selection process. And so, one day I'll work on that. If anyone else wants to do that. Uh, feel free. Uh, I'd be very happy to uh, to use your uh, your your uh, code afterwards, uh, and, and possibly something for the statisticians to get stuck into and the programmers. Anyway, I digress. Uh, bootstraps. Um, there, each training set is, is is the same size as original data. Um, the number of samples in the test set will vary, which uh, may or may not be frustrating for you, or certainly in, in terms of data handling. And uh, there's no limit on how many tests. You can keep going as long as you like um, until you get bored. But make sure that you, you have a, a minimum of around about 50. And the, the loose EV test we were doing, 236. Uh, so you know, 50 is, is you know, it's quite small really in that respect. So uh, to compare them and when do we use them? So, uh, so some of these are computationally light. Uh, so that's good. So if you have a lot of data, but not many resources, then then that's good. Uh, and really, you probably only use the holdout test for something quick and dirty, just to see, just to get a feel for something. Uh, it's not, you know, we should we shouldn't be reporting that. We should be using something stronger now. I think in, in this field, um, Blue CV is is easy to implement. Um, although you could argue that you're actually not implementing yourself, someone else is implementing that for you in a library, and you're just using it. So that's you know, that doesn't that's good for the programmers, but the general user, it's probably not relevant. You don't need to stratify your data, and you get a, a good distribution of answers. Um, it's good when you don't have very many samples. If you've got a million samples, you're going to be doing a million tests. That's not good. Uh, press test uses um, leave one out cross validation internally, and it repeats that. So we're doing um, the, the press test. You, you you build a model. You say, okay, using one principal component, how well do I predict the raw data? Give me a metric. Then you do it again for the second principal component. How well do I approximate the raw data? So that's two tests. Third principal component, you do it again. Fourth principal component again. So you keep going up on principal components until you get to a point when the press test, uh, I think you come up with the value goes above or below one compared to the previous answer, something like that. And um, 
and at that point you stop. But you may have done a, a number of different runs there, each of which would involve 236 uh, analyses. So, um, so that it can escalate quite quickly if you're not careful. K-fold is, is good if you have a large number of samples, uh, but you don't have much uh, compute resource to do these on because you're only doing a small number of tests, maybe five-fold, ten-fold, you're only doing five or ten tests. Bootstrap, um, there, there's, there's a literature which says that Bootstrap is better than the others. I'm not going to argue with them. I'll let you argue amongst yourselves about that. Uh, but you need to have quite a number of samples, otherwise it's, it's, the, the, the sampling is it's not going to help. And you might need lots of compute resource, but again, it's, it's possible to paralyze that. So what we did is we, um, we, we did some tests with uh, canonical variance analysis, because that's better than principal components analysis, because we have a priori information. We uh, produced um, uh, confusion matrices um, for these, uh, if there are only two pluses, we would be using a continuous matrix and get more, more metrics for that. But we were calculating things based on uh, the percentage correct classification for this data. Um, we, we, if you only do one test, you only get one answer. If you do more tests, you get more answers. You get a better feel for it, so you know what your expectation is. But if I were to go into the clinic and analyze uh, a patient's blood, I would have a better feel for where that patient lay in the in the distribution of um, well to unhealthy, for example, and um, and and that's so that's one of the things that we're getting out of these, these validation methods, and uh, and and by repeating this analysis, we're getting a, a better understanding. So I'll I'll leave you with a, a couple of um, of, of quotes. Um, one from from Tukey, um, uh, and which I think is 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 quite important. Particularly, I think uh, talking some uh, somewhat to let's say to the PhD students out, out there in the audience, um, you know, you really want to get an answer, and in fact, your boss might really want to get an answer, you know, and uh, she might be like, "Come on, there's definitely something in this we should get there," and uh, and I think that's um, that's good, but it doesn't mean to say that you're going to be able to get anything out of it. <laughs> um, you, your data will tell you what it will tell you, and we need to be honest about when the data says no, this this didn't work. <laughs> no. uh, vibrational spectroscopy is not the solution to everything. Um, I worked in uh, in mass spectrometry as well. Mass spectrometry is not the answer to everything. If it's the only tool you've got, as this expression, um, uh, if when you only have a hammer, everything is a nail. Uh, yeah, but sometimes you know, comparable techniques are good, and there are methods for validating uh, um, multi-technique, multi multi-modality approaches, which is a whole other talk. And, and perhaps if we're going to do this uh, again, then and that's an interesting topic. I think I'll talk about. So, it's, uh, a combination of some data and an aching desire for an answer does not ensure that a reasonable answer can be extracted from any body of data. And uh, it's true. And then I'll leave you with. Um, uh, with uh, a politician, an American politician, and uh, and he was uh, he was belittled for saying this. Um, uh, there are known unknowns, and these and these things that we know we know, and there are known unknowns that say there are things we know we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns. These are things we don't know we don't know. And although it sounds a bit crazy and it's quite difficult to say it twice uh, in quick succession, uh, he's probably right. Um, um, possibly one of the only things he was right on in his career, but um, there we are. So I'll leave you with that, and uh, thank you very much for for, uh, for listening, assuming there's anyone still out there in uh, Cyberland, and um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex. That was a true tutorial for students, for new newcomers uh, in chemometrics, and I think that for advanced specialists as well. Uh, there's plenty of questions, oh. <laughs> and uh, I will try to choose maybe uh, some of them because uh, Claudia will help you and reply for some concerns. Hey. Jesus, okay, Jesus. okay. Uh, Professor Beata Valchak uh, raised her hand, so please, uh, uh, it's time for you. Okay. 
Many thanks, Alex, for lovely tutorial. I really enjoy it. Uh, my question is, why bootstrapping and not randomization or permutation test? Do you have uh, an experience with randomization of permutation to tell us uh, why you prefer bootstrapping? Um, oh, that's a good, oh, that's a good question. I, I, I kind of expected a good question. That's a good question. Uh, I would say, um, I think they both have a place. I, in a way, they're both kind of doing something similar. Uh, a permutation test is very important in this. It, it, it's partly, you know, sort of checking that your labels are right. You know, have we, did we analyze the right sample and things like that? You get a slightly different metric there. So I didn't, uh, I mean, I haven't, I haven't covered that, but I'm not saying that it's, um, uh, I think it's. I think they're both. They're both valid, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't know whether to say one was better or or worse than the other. So, uh, so I think I'm going to. I'm going to defer to other statisticians in the audience. Okay. <laughs> Claudia might know, or, or or if you have an answer, if you have a particular um, perspective, then I'd be interested in that also. Okay, if I can, another question. Uh, you selected, you use canonical variance analysis. This is based on correlation. Isn't it risky? Ooh. Well, it's, uh, yes, I mean, I, personally, I, I prefer a random forest, but, um, but, Random forest requires you to explain the random forest process before you get started. So uh, <laughs> I, I, and, and therefore I, I sort of prefer to uh, prefer to take something that people knew. You, there will be correlation in the data. Um, there's, there's an argument to say the correlation in the data anyway, and uh, you know that's what we're trying to find. Um, so because if you if you compare very such paper by. Uh, Jasper Angel from Buiden's group about the regularized uh, MANOVA. And concept is quite similar, okay? It's just regularization introduced there instead of PCA compression. And uh, results can be quite different when you compare with ASCA or ANOVA target projection. So sometimes they are better because correlation, it is what you are looking for. If uh, Variance is too big and not relevant for why, but sometimes it's just artificial type of, of correlation and features are not very stable. I'm just curious, okay, you can always choose the method you like, but my question is, did you try other method or...? or... Uh, not, not for this, no, but I... I um... Uh, no, so the, the, my two sort of go-to methods really are, are uh, canonical variance and random forest, um, and, and partly for different reasons. Uh, I, I quite like the the, uh, the the canonical variance because it it helps to it gives you an idea of why your classes were were yes. were separated, yeah. that, which a lot of the techniques don't. For you know, support vector machines don't tell you anything like that. They're just they just put things into boxes. We don't tell you why they put something into a box, and I think why is important here, and um, and and it's very quick and easy to do. Yes, agree. So, yeah. Agree. Thank you very much, Wazudek. As uh, I will try to uh, to read some questions. Uh, if there is any uh, uh, further discussion, because uh, Claudia will reply uh, for uh, help you, uh, so I try. So that is a question that uh, um, about the K-fold CV example that you showed, and uh, uh, shouldn't uh, there be some reasonable ratio of K and N in the K-fold cross validation? Is a question from 1050. If you have a look at chat, so there is the question about the ratio. Should we pay attention with the ratio between K and N values? 
What 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 time are we talking? Everyone's been 10 chatting. 50. No one's been listening. Ten fifty. Ten fifty. Yeah. Well, if that's ten. Yeah. Uh, I don't. Oh, I wonder. I wonder if this is my time, not your time. I'm in uh, a so it's your time is nine fifty. Ah, oh, there we go. Yes, nine fifty. Uh, oh, from Jan. Hi, Jan. Um, <laughs> Yes, uh, the, yes, okay. There, I think there probably is, and I would not be at all surprised if Claudia hasn't actually explored that. Um, because, uh, and actually, there's an interesting uh, debate on um, Stack Exchange. Uh, I can't remember which one it is, it's the uh, statistics um, Stack Exchange um, that Claudia was involved in, which is like debating um, whether something what the relative merits are of um, of the different k folds and and whether one is better than the other and and are they different for regression versus uh, classification discrimination and there's, there's quite a that was quite an interesting debate which started to <laughs> become up here and uh, and this is where I I, uh, I call in my assistant uh, <laughs> glad you to help out there uh, there's definitely some. There definitely will be a relationship between K and N, and where that lies, I don't know. It's, uh, it would be an interesting test homework for someone, perhaps. Yeah, well, I, I think there's. Okay, I, I I hear that. I I saw that you raised the, the hand. So if you yeah. would like to join the discussion, you are uh, welcome. Yes, thank you. Well, I, I well, first of all, I think there's there's still room for one or more papers to be written about that topic. Um, my current understanding is that there, let's say there, there's some kind of, of limits within which K actually doesn't matter much. Um, so within the, the usual K between 5 and 10, I would usually, if there's a number that um, um, d divides my, my samples without reminder, I'd go for that one. So very, very practical. Um, there are a few considerations. One is that, of course, if K equals N, then we are in the, in the leave one out situation. And leave one out is really a different animal uh, from pretty much all the resampling um, validations where you have more than one sample left out. It's maybe a bit too, well, we'll be, discussion would maybe get crazy if, if we dig in detail into that. But one thing that people should keep in mind is for certain types of classification models, leave one out can be a very pessimistic um, estimate. And that's for classifiers um, that look and take into account the, the relative frequencies of classes. Because with leave one out, you'll then always have left out, or you, you will always test a class that is compared to the, the overall data set in a minority in the, in the surrogate training set. Um, so I would recommend Keep your fingers away from leave one out unless you have a special reason to do leave one out. I do leave one out if there's only that something like three samples that are properly independent, then there's nothing else to do basically. Um, other than that, the I, I think the uncertainty of of what our results from the cross validation are depends a lot on the total number of cases that we test. And if we look over the, the whole run of a K-fault cross-validation, this is the same. It doesn't matter whether we, we um, uh, test five times two samples or 10 times one sample, it's always 10 samples. Um, so then the, 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 the choice of K and versus N um, becomes a matter of um, computation. 
And maybe also a matter, I would say the total number of surrogate models that we look at should be sufficient to check stability. But that's a totally, that's an issue that, that hasn't even been mentioned, I think, so far. Thank you very much, Claudia. Uh, maybe the last question to uh, Alex. Sorry to, to speed up, but it's uh, uh, the, uh, almost 11.30. Uh, David asks you, Alex, which is, in your opinion, the best way of dealing with unbalanced number of samples per class when doing bootstrapping? Oh. This is a question from 1003. Yeah, yes, okay. Uh, so what I've done with that, there is there's a, a, a technique called something like a, a bag of little bootstraps or something, where you can bootstrap within each uh, within each class, so that uh, so that it keeps your balance. Um, it it depends. So some of it depends on how unbalanced things are. So if you're not very uh, unbalanced, you know, you got like uh, sixty forty, then that will probably come out in the wash. If you've got uh, a heavily uh, unbalanced class, like ninety ten something like that, then um, one of the problems is that you're because you're randomly sampling, you've got, some of your models are going to end up with a very uh, high number of, of one of the classes, the majority class, you know, and it's not going to, your, uh, your minority class is not going to appear so much. And that's where it causes problems. So for bootstrapping, if you, if you keep going and you do more and more and more bootstraps, then it will become more stable. But of course, each test is slightly biased towards the, um, the the majority class. So, um, if you if you need to deal with large uh, unbalanced data, then um, then undersampling is is an approach. If you have uh, a large number of samples, where you you say uh, my minimum set is say I have a minimum of a hundred spectra, and my majority my minority class is hundred spectra, my majority is like six hundred. Then you say, all right, I'm just going to throw away five hundred of one of them and have a hundred each. So they become balanced, but there you, you are losing a lot of information that you've measured, which could be important in developing um, a, a solution. So um, the oversampling was mentioned yesterday, and there was some discussion on that. Um, oversampling, I, it has a problem because it in, introduces duplicates, but of course, bootstrapping is also introducing duplicates. And, in, and if you compare the, um, the, you know, something I mentioned about, say, we're measuring the heights of the school kids, where you've got the whole population and you're only taking a small sample of that. Then, of course, in the whole population, there would be some children who are the same height. So you will be getting some duplicate answers in the real world anyway. So in a, in a sense, you're sort of, um, when you're, you're, you're subsampling, you're, you're subsampling your small view of the real world, over and over and over again, and if you're introducing duplicates, then that, if you had taken that sample a different time from the real world, you may, may have got a different distribution anyway. So in a sense, it, 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 if you have a lot of samples, then you're getting uh, in total a lot of spectra, then you've got a better representation of the real world, and therefore any duplication in there is, is, is all already present. And therefore, it's not so bad. If you're taking a small amount, then your your model is already underpowered, because you don't have enough spectra to to really describe the, the true population uh, appropriately. Uh, you could you could do a little oversample and a little undersample. So instead of six hundred to one hundred, you could meet somewhere around about two hundred, three hundred, and then bootstrap that. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe really the last question, because I want to remind that Alex promised us to show some uh, toolboxes, uh, remember, at noon, so in a half an hour. So let's give him a few minutes to have a rest. Uh, so, but maybe the last question, Professor Val, uh, uh, Valchak, you had uh, something more? Yeah, just a few comments. I spent really few months trying to deal with uh, this unbalanced stuff because I had this type of real problem. And my final conclusion is uh, make undersampling. Oversampling will never help you. 
never ever if properly validated. Because if you are making bootstrapping, you can just take, uh, repeat it more times to make, uh, to take profit of this larger class. You won't gain anything if you properly validate with oversampling. Okay, so just to, to let you know that I, I really took my time to with simulated data, with real data. Uh, I had a look at all these approaches starting from small, different type of of uh, simulating replicates, etc. And final conclusion is. Uh, make uh, undersampling accor according to me, okay? <laughs> so for the moment, it is what I believe in. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah. I would like at the end to thank all speakers from this morning sessions. Both presentation was really fantastic and I think that it helped us to understand uh, these secrets of chemometrics and preprocessing. As I said, um, uh, Alex uh, uh, is going to meet you again at, in half an hour, so uh, you can just stay on the, in this canal uh, and uh, come back in half an hour after a s short refreshment. Uh, somebody from our team will uh, begin the meeting again. And I think that if there are more questions or um, more concerns, there is the option to uh, discuss with us, with Alex as well. So thank you very much, all of you, for participating in this session. And uh, you are invited uh, in the next one, which will start at 1 p.m. Uh, with the lecture presentation of Claudia. So thank you very much and uh, have a good uh, time now. Bye bye.